the human heart is a twin pump which is working 24 into 7 to not only pump the purified blood into various tissues for the supply of oxygen and glucose, but also <coughs> to eliminate the carbon dioxide and other waste that has been generated by the, by the body during the energy production. It has a circulatory system through which a closed loop circulation takes place for the glucose and oxygen to be supplied. Nature has provided the human body with a, with a safety system for this closed loop system. For example, when we have an injury, the first thing that happens is there is a sequential biochemical reaction that takes place wherein the blood clots. This prevents the further outflow of the blood. Two, there is an inflammation that occurs and this inflammation once again triggers a lot of chemical reactions inside the body which triggers the cells to grow and the, the repair to take place. <coughs> the science in the healthcare has progressed to a tremendous extent wherein we are not only able to do a lot of intervention procedures but also able to replace the whole organs by itself. But at the ground reality, if we make an assessment, what do we really see? We really see that even the basic health needs are not being met with either in the developing countries or even in the upcoming developed countries. Before we would actually go into the need of the Indian subcontinent, we just wanted to have a quick look at how the advanced countries are able to tackle the high cost medical procedures. To make a quick comparison, if you compare India with the, with the USA, USA has a population of roughly 320 million and a 16 million coronary artery disease patients. And India comparatively has 1.2 billion population and 65 million coronary artery disease patients. But if you look at the number of procedures that is done in the US, they really do a 1 million stenting versus 0.1 million stenting in India. If we look at the reasons for that, what we see is that there is a lack of infrastructure and also a lack of human resource. For example, in the US, we have got 2,000 cath labs and 20,000 intervention cardiologists manning these cath labs. In India, we hardly have 1,500 cath labs and we have 500 cath labs and we just have 1,500 cardiologists manning these cath labs. But there is a cost to this. If you look at what the US spends, the US nearly spends close to $3,000 billion to provide health care, whereas in India, the, 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 the cost that is incurred is less than $95 billion. This arises a lot of questions in our mind. And the basic question is, if we have to provide the basic health care to all the Indians, do we really have to upscale the infrastructure to the same level as that is done in the US? Or two, do we really go ahead and develop low cost devices and low cost healthcare systems? Or three, do we really come up with the technology which is actually able to handle the whole ecosystem around the healthcare system? And all these have to once again fit into our ecosystem. Now with these questions, it was interesting that you know, four of us met at the ISB and all of us were coming from different diverse backgrounds. Aju basically comes from flavor and the spice industry, a second general entrepreneur. And then I had Ravi who basically you know, had spent 10 years in Japan working on project and project implementation. And Dr. Satya Chawa who was a scientist working on churning out patents after patents working on development of bulk drugs. So what we really, you know, what ISP and the PGP Max course did to us was even though we came from diverse, diverse backgrounds, say our chemistry gelled very quickly. And because our chemistry gelled very quickly, it was very easy for us to sort out the maths and physics that is there in any business. So with this, what we really looked into is, if we had a lot of questions about how to really bring out a solution to the healthcare 
suited to the Indian conditions, we really looked at the first solution was, why not we first concentrate on this 24 into 7 organ? And that is how our first project came out, which we coined as Heart to Hearts. Before I really go into what we really developed and then what the impact that it is going to make on the healthcare sector, let me briefly take you through the anatomy of the coronary artery and the coronary artery disease. As I said, heart is a 24 into 7 pump. Okay. But because it has to work 24 into 7, it has got its own circulatory system, which we called as the coronary circulatory system. Now, in a normal human being, what happens? The lumens are fully intact. And if I take a cross section of this coronary arteries, what you see is inside layer, we call it the smooth, the endothelial cells act as a pavement cells, which is basically making the blood flow easily without any dynamics happening there. Two, behind this, I have got a smooth muscle cells, which is actually acting as an elastic, this one for the, when the pumping takes place. This, the endothelial cells is actually preventing the bloods from clotting. But as you know, the age progresses due to various reasons like genetic, our health, our lifestyle, our eating habits, you know, there is a deposition of cholesterol taking place in the coronary vessels. The first doubt everybody would have is if there is a block happening, why not I simply remove it there? This block is different from the regular blocks that takes place in our sanitary systems. Here the block is not taking place in the lumen, but is taking place within the walls. So that makes it very difficult. And as the deposition progresses, what is happening is this pushes the endothelial cells down into the lumen and at a certain stage the rupture happens. And when the rupture happens, the blood clots because as I said earlier, the human body has a built-in safety system. When it sees something rough, the nature is to, for the clot to take place. And as the clot takes place, the distal flow of the blood to the heart muscle is completely stopped and the heart attack sets in. Now, this is actually how the coronary artery disease progresses. There are a lot of developments that took place for the treatment of this. We had the bypass surgeries coming up. But later on, a lot of interventions started happening. And if you look at the how the history and the technology of the interventions progressed. In the early 70s, we had the balloon technology coming up, followed by the 90s, wherein we had the bare metal stent technology coming up. And in the 2002 and 3, we had the drug eluting stent coming up. And in 2014-15, the next generation, which we call as the fourth generation, is going to hit the commercial market. Let me quickly take you across through the technology progression. As I said, the first one in the intervention is the balloon angioplasty. In this, the technology involves expanding a high-pressure balloon at the, site of, at the site of the plague formation. What this high-pressure balloon does is it compresses the plague and the density of the plague is increased, thereby increasing the lumen size. And as once the lumen size increases, the blood flow becomes normal. There are certain advantages with this process, but there are two major disadvantages that happen. What happened when the high pressure balloon was deployed, it made the dissection of the vessel which made flaps to hang around and as once the flaps hanged around, there was abrupt closure of the vessel. So this made it mandatory for an emergency bypass. So in 19, early uh, 1970s and 80s, if somebody has to undergo an angioplasty, it was mandatory for a surgeon to be made available with the, with the surgery team readily in, in the operation theater. The second problem that was there was the recoil that was taking place and another important physiological activity was taking there. As I said, whenever there is an injury, what is happening, the first thing is blood clots. The second thing that happens is there is inflammation which is triggering the growth. As the cells get triggered, in this case, the smooth muscle cells that are there behind the endothelial cells, the cell starts proliferating. And in 25 to 50 percent of the cases, in the case of balloon angioplasty, it was close to 50 percent. 50 percent of the cases, the cells never stopped at normal growing and they started further proliferating. And as the further proliferation happened, the blood vessel used to get closed, which we called as restenosis. Now, technology was thought of. Then the solution was the second generation technology, which we called as a stent. 
Stent is basically a metallic scaffold. They are nothing but slotted tubes that are put onto the balloons and the balloons are expanded at high pressure. As we expand the balloons, the, the metal is, jacket is expanded and it goes and sits into the blocked area. Now the advantage was that any flap that was there was actually protected. And two, there was no subsequent closure because the metal gave the necessary radial strength to, to keep open the artery. But it had its own disadvantages. The first disadvantage was it was a metal casing. So uh, we are bringing in something artificial into the nature. Two, because of the high pressure deployment once again, there was injury that was caused, followed by inflammation, followed by the growth that was taking place. So the restenosis rate was coming up to 25%. Two, the inflammation, because we had a metal jacket there, the inflammation was constant. It was like a time bomb sitting there. We do not know when that inflammation is going to lead to cellular growth once again. Next, people came with the third generation technology. In 2002-2003, we came out with what is known as drug eluting stents. The misconception what everybody has is when somebody talks of the drug eluting stent, they think there is a drug there that is actually giving a therapeutic effect. But if you look at really what is quoted in a drug eluting stent is basically an anti-cancer drug. So what does anti-cancer drug do? It prevents cellular growth. But once again as I said, even though it was preventing the cellular growth, it had its own problem. The anti-cancer drug cannot differentiate between a growing endothelial cell and a growing smooth muscle cell. And we all know that if I have to get a production from a foreign body, it has to be fully covered by endothelial cells. So what was happening is, I still had the problem of the metallic jacket there. Even though there was no smooth muscle proliferation taking place, the stretch were not covered by the endothelial cells. So even two to three years down the lane, the patient is always forced to be on an antiplatelet therapy. That is, I do not want the blood to clot there. And by mistake, for three days he does not take the drug, then people landed into what is known as late thrombosis. 3 years, 4 years down the lane after implantation, suddenly on a dentist, on a dental table, people collapsed and died. So there was a lot of problem associated with that. The second thing, if you look into the Indian context, the real problem that we had was we already have a very low infrastructure. So what is happening in the demand and supply, if you look at the demand and supply, say you have got limited resources, but you have got a huge population. So only those who are affluent are able to really afford this. And even when the second wave of the restenosis comes, so who are these people once again going back and then you know putting a burden on our infrastructure is basically the affluent people. So that made the people you know at the middle layer completely cut off from the technology. So when we looked at this type of things, we came out with a technology which we called as bioabsorbable stent. Now the difference here is that what happens in a bioabsorbable stent is the stent has to provide a mechanical scaffolding support for a minimum period of time. In this case, it is 5 months. So what it does is it provides the mechanical scaffold for the first 5 months. And in our case, we went one step ahead when compared to the other bioabsorbable stents. What we have designed is I have a multi-layer tube that is being made from where the stent is made. So my stent is made up of a multi-layered bioabsorbable material and I can control the degradation rate of each and every layer. So with that what happens is for the first month I can give the perfect radial strength that is needed for the artery to be held up. In this same period what I do is I release in the first phase what is known as the anti-proliferative drugs which are similar like the anti-cancer drugs. So for the first initial stage I release the anti-proliferative drug. So what happens is it stops the smooth muscle cell from proliferating. But immediately I have the second drug that is being released which we call it as a pro-healing drug. So what the pro-healing drug does is it basically chelates the free radicals and allows the endothelial cells to really grow on it. So endothelial cells quickly grow onto these stents and the next phase after 5 months is where it is designed or engineered for the molecular breakdown to start happening. And as the molecular breakdown starts happening, the, the stent is fully absorbed inside the body within 18 months time. And this whole process, what I have is the pro-healing drug is continuously released. This achieves two, you know, basically two, I get two answers out of this. The first one is after 18 months, I do not have a metal jacket there. 
So there is no straightening of the artery. There is no inflammation there, number one. Two, with the release of the pro-healing drug, it removes the plague and actually brings back the vasomotion in picture. Because for the artery to, to really recover, I have to give it back the natural vasomotion that is needed, which nature has provided it. So this technology actually brings in the restoration. So we actually call it as a vascular restoration therapy. So the advantage here is that after 18 months, I have actually cured the coronary artery disease. There is no metal there. So we got a lot of results for this. The first result what we got was, I moved a product from being a first aid product to a therapeutic delivery product. We reduced the re-stenosis rate. And when I reduce the re-stenosis rate, the load on the existing infrastructure is brought down drastically. Instead of 30 percent people going back, now that 30 percent capacity is available to the common man. And we need not really spend so much on the infrastructure like what has been done in the West. By cutting down your infrastructure cost, you will be able to economize, better economize the usage of the capex. That was what it would achieve. Another important thing that it does is, in the case of a drug eluting stent, metallic drug eluting stent, the patient has to be on anti-proliferative drug lifelong. In this case, just after five to six months, the anti-proliferative drug usage could be stopped, wherein once again, the load on the healthcare system is brought down. You need not have the patient buying these costly drugs lifelong. So what, what we essentially achieved is a total reduction in the ecosystem of the healthcare. And there are a lot of couple of spin-offs that was there in this technology. This technology could be utilized for the diabetic foot. So today we know India is the, is the diabetic capital of the world. And in the case of diabetic foot, the vasoconstriction takes place, the blood flow is fully cut off to the leg and the neurons die. So there is no sensation also available. And if you put any antibiotic drug to the diabetic patient, it is not at all available to the tissue where the injury happens. So this will lead to amputation of the legs. Whereas in this case, if you could have a device which should not only open up the, the blocked vessels, but also would heal the tissues down there, it is going to lead to a normal leg and then we could actually prolong the gradation of in the diabetic area. Another spin-off that we are really looking into is in the targeted drug delivery in chemotherapy. Today when there is a chemotherapy taking place, the drug will not be able to identify a, a, a growing good cell and a growing tumorous cell. It affects the RBC, the WBC, the hair cells. Whereas with this type of technology, a, a fraction of a drug could be loaded and then released at the site of the activity. And as the, as the device gets degraded, the drug is only released to the tumor that is there and then the tumor would get killed. And what do we achieve in the whole process is, we are not only prolonging the, the quantity of life of the patient, but are also improving the quality of the life of the patient. <clears throat> now, the most important thing is, today India has to go a very long way in, in, in basically able to provide the healthcare to the millions of population that is there. So what is needed is a judicious combination of technology and entrepreneurship. We just should not look at bringing down the cost of a product, but I think the technology should enable us to bring down the cost of the whole ecosystem around the, the particular product. So what we call our products, we call them as the next gen products, because they just not only lower down the cost of production, but also would lower down the cost of the burden that it could provide on the nation. A simple example which I would like to really emphasize here is on a simple product like a urinary catheter. Most of us in the audience would have gone through this process where people above 60 years because of various problems have to be catheterized by using simple latex catheters. So if I am a technologist and people tell me this is the burden for this product and somebody is importing it 100 rupees, what would normal technologists look at is can I make it at 90 rupees? But I think that is not the solution. What we must look at it, if somebody is undergoing a catheterization today, somebody 65 years old, 40 percent of them are going back to the hospital with infection. And what does this lead us to? One, use of very costly antibiotics. Two, load on the hospital beds, which we really don't have today. Load on the doctors that are there and also the stress that is there onto the patient and also around the relatives that he has got. 
So we must look at a technology wherein if, if I am able to coat an antimicrobial agent that could be just released at the site of implantation, bring down the infection rate from 40 percent to below 5 percent, I am achieving a great thing. The product may cost me 10 rupees more instead of 100 rupees. I could have the product into the market at 110 rupees. But what is it I am achieving at the end of the day is by blending in a technology here, I am able to bring down the total cost on the expenditure by itself. So this is what we call as a next gen. Next gen does not mean that it must be on the very high end part of it. It is blending in of technology into an entrepreneurship wherein we are able to come out with a product that is going to solve the whole economic system around our healthcare system. And I think it is our duty here with, with lot of people having entrepreneurial background. I think it is our responsibility to really look at this from this angle rather than just looking at duplicate something else. Thank you very much.